When you tried to pick the pocket of a Civilar in the night-shrouded streets of Waterdeep, you never thought she'd catch you. And you never dreamed she'd press you into her service. Now you must find a baby griffin stolen by the beholder Xanathar, the leader of the city's powerful thieves' guild. Or you can count on spending the rest of your life behind bars. Hello, and welcome back to Let's Play Game Books. Today's book, Endless Quest to Catch a Thief by Matt Forbeck. This is from a new run of Endless Quest books that came out only a few years ago, uh, long after the original run from the 80s. You little thief, the hooded noblewoman says as she leans over you, your hand caught in her vice-like grip. You finally tried to rob the wrong person, haven't you? She sounds more amused than angry, but you wonder if the luck you've relied on for most of your life has finally run out. As you gaze up at the woman staring back at you from under the cowl of her voluminous cloak, you realize you've just tried to pick the pocket of none other than Laryl Silverhand, the open lord of Waterdeep. If you'd known, you'd have kept walking, maybe all the way out of the city. You cast about for a way to break free from her, but you see that a patrol of the City Watch, Waterdeep's combination local police and militia force, now has you surrounded. Their leader, a rough-looking woman with the middling rank of Sibilar, makes a gesture, and two of the blades working for her race up and hold your arms tight as cold iron shackles. I didn't do anything, you say. You might as well be protesting that the half-moon shining between Waterdeep's rooftops is the noonday sun. I suppose a grimy halfling like you had your hand in Lord Silverhand's pocket to help her scratch an itch, the Sibilar says with a haughty laugh. You do your best to look innocent as you give Lord Silverhand a heartfelt shrug. She seemed like an incautious noble who'd wandered into the wrong part of town, and you thought you'd teach her a gentle lesson in why she should keep a better eye on her coinage. It seems she's going to be your professor tonight instead. I tripped, you say, with as much honesty as you can fake. I apologize for steadying myself on her, but surely that's no crime. With a wry smile, Lord Silverhand shakes her head at you the way your mother used to when she caught you with your hand in the cookie jar. Mm -mm -mm. There will be no lying their way out of this, you can tell. Hold this one off to the prison in Castle Waterdeep. The Civil R orders the men of the city watch who surround you. And quickly, we have bigger fish to fry tonight. It strikes me, Civil R Jalso, that our little friend here could help us with that, Lord Silverhand says. She gazes into your eyes. You seem like a loyal and dutiful citizen of Waterdeep, after all, aren't you? I, I love Waterdeep more than anything, you say, eager to please. You're not sure where she's going with this, but if it's anywhere other than jail, you're game to hear more. I had something stolen from my home tonight. I, I didn't have anything to do with that, you protest. I have an alibi. Or you will, if your pals back at your favorite tavern hold up their end of your standing bargain. Don't be stupid, she also says. The item was stolen by members of our local thieves' guild, of which you're clearly not a member. And it's already in the hands of their master, the Xanathar. You blanch at the mention of that name. The Xanathar is the title of the leader of Waterdeep's legendary thieves' guild. That alone would make him dangerous enough. But the current occupant of that position is a beholder a floating creature about a yard across with a single eye in its middle, and ten eye stalks, each of which can cast a deadly spell. It seems you don't get to be the Xanathar without being incredibly powerful to start with. You gaze up at the open lord of Waterdeep and swallow hard. Now you know she's, where she's heading with this. And you need me to get it back? Silverhand nods. It's vitally important that we recover it, and we could use the help of someone embedded in the underworld, knowledgeable about its ways, but not loyal to the Xenathar. Someone like you. You eye her suspiciously. What was stolen? She purses her lips as though she's not going to tell you, and then spits it out. A baby griffin! If you try to bluff your way out, turn to page 6. Refuse to help, turn to page 9. Agree to help, turn to page 17. Oh, three choices. I'm going to need to go get some dice. 
All right, we are going to refuse to help. You want me to steal a baby griffin back from a beholder who happens to be the head of the most powerful thieves guild in all Faerun? You shiver at the idea. I think I'd be better off in jail. The Sivlar bashes you across the chin. You seem to have mistaken Lord Silverhand's request for a request. You spit blood and glare up at her. I think we were both quite clear. Lord Silverhand intervenes on your behalf. Such violence is hardly necessary, Sivlar Jalso. Fine, Jalso says with an angry slash of her hand. Toss the little thief in our dankest cell to rot, she orders her men. You shout in protest, but you've already made your decision and they've made theirs. No matter how many second chances they might offer you, there's no way you want to go up against the Xanathar, much less the entirety of the Thieves' Guild, which means that they have no use for you at all, which means you're going to jail. Despite your history of crime in Waterdeep, you've never actually been caught before. Well, not captured, at least. You normally stuck to crimes like burglary that tended to keep you and your victims well apart. You curse yourself for indulging an impulse to steal what you thought was a noble's purse just to prove you could do it, and for not being fast enough to get away once you were spotted. The Watchers are as unforgiving as the iron cuffs they fasten to your wrists. They bang you around as they march you through the streets and haul you up to Castle Waterdeep. There they hand you over to the jailers who strip you of all your belongings but your clothes and throw you into a cell in the deepest part of the dungeons beneath. There's one window in the cell and it's a vertical slash only a few inches wide. Even if you could remove the bars, not even someone as small as you could crawl out through it. You decide to settle in and wait. Surely someone will come by eventually to feed you and get you ready for your trial. Even a lowly thief like you has the right to an appearance before a judge, right? After a full day in the cell, though, you realize that no one's coming. You cry out for help and protest your innocence, but the other prisoners, who sound rather far away, only laugh at your words. Eventually, you decide to save what little there is left of your voice. Is this really to be your fate? To die of thirst for having the temerity to try to steal the purse of the open Lord of Waterdeep? Admittedly, that was incredibly dumb, but should something so simple be a capital offense? It rains that night, but none of the water drips into your cell. It's as if the gods are tormenting you for your arrogance. As the days pass by, you grow weaker, too weak to even call for help anymore. But no one comes for you, not in time. A week later, Jalso remembers you and comes down into the prison to check on you, but it's too late. Your remains are tossed into the waters outside the castle to feed the sharks that patrol there. The end. Okay, that's about as bad an ending as I could have gotten. So I guess we're going to have to help with this um, mission. Let's go back and try again. <sighs> uh, baby griffin? You try to keep the shock from your voice, but fail. Does it bite? Yes, but uh, I'd worry more about the claws, Lord Silverhand says offhandedly, the way you might describe the qualities of a particular meal. Even on a baby, those talons are far sharper than the beak. Uh, the ones on the back claws or the front ones? You've never tangled with a griffin, and you don't really care about the details of how it might dismember you. You're really just stalling for time. Lord Silverhand can see straight through your pathetic efforts to distract her. She gives you a half-amused smile. A griffin has the front half of a giant eagle and the back half of a lion, she says. But what difference does it make which end it uses to tear you apart? You rub your chin as if you're considering your decision, even though you've already made it. As dangerous as the griffin might be, Disappointing the open lord of Waterdeep is sure to be a great deal more troublesome. I, uh, I think I can help you with that. There should be a sizable reward for the creature's return, right? The Sivlar smacks you in the back of your head. The only reward you'll receive is to keep your worthless hide out of prison. You consider showing a woman the pointy end of your knife, but Lord Silverhand waves her off. That's enough, Sivlar Jalso. The Sivlar backs away, grumbling. Clearly, she'd prefer to deal with you more brutally. Lord Silverhand turns to you. If you manage to retrieve the little griffin and return her unharmed, rest assured that I can be quite generous in my gratitude. You hold back your urge to scoff at her. 
To think that you might trust in the generosity of a noble, even one as famous and powerful as the open lord, might be a bit much, but you don't need to bring her wrath down on you by openly mocking her. If you have the griffin in hand, though, that should be enough to shake loose something from the lord's pockets. At least, that's what you tell yourself. You rub your head and glare at the civil R. Reward or not, you rationalize, chasing the little monster down certainly beats going to jail, especially since you're not sure that you'd even make it that far in Jalso's custody. You give the lord your best smile. That's good enough for me. So, what's our first step? Has the Xanathar issued any demands yet? Some sort of ransom for the griffin's safe return, perhaps? Lord Silverhand shakes her head. A deep frown creases her brow. He seems bent on keeping the creature. You sigh in disappointment. So he's just going to keep the little tyke indefinitely? Seems like this problem just might take care of itself. Won't the griffin eventually grow large enough to just eat him? He'll take the time to train it to be loyal to him, Jalso says. We believe he wants to raise it as a mount for one of his lieutenants. Imagine the havoc such a creature could wreak under our populace if it was left under the Xanathar's control. You grimace as you give up on the idea that the Lord might be able to wait the thieves out. It looks like you don't have much of a choice but to help the City Watch find the Griffin. At least, if you want to live in Waterdeep and remain outside of one of its fine prisons. All right, you say. I'll do it. I'll find your little Griffin and I'll bring it back home. But you're going to have to give me some space to work. So you can run off on us, she also says with a snarl. You want me to start poking around the Thieves Guild, right? How many thieves do you think are going to be caught dead talking to me if I just waltz up to them with the city watch on my trail? She also opens her mouth to protest, but you cut her off. If you think they won't see you coming, you're wrong. He has a point, Lord Silverhand says. You give him your mom likes me best grin. You're going to have to trust me, you tell the Lord. At least a little bit. Otherwise, this is never going to work. Fair enough. She bends down and gazes right into her eyes. Don't give me cause to regret it. Then she turns to Jolso. I assume you can take it from here. I need to return to my manor. The Sivlar gives her a firm nod. You can rely on us. If you start asking questions around town, turn to page 26. If you ask the Sivlar what you should do, turn to page 28. Okay, I don't know what to do. I guess I'll ask the Sivlar for help. I admit it, you say to Jelso, I've never tried hunting down a kidnapped baby griffin before. I'm at a loss as to where to begin. Don't you think you ought to show me that you can be at least somewhat useful before you give up? She asks, with more than a hint of menace in her voice. Uh, oh, no, 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 you shake your head emphatically and you show her the palms of your hands. I'm not giving up, not at all. I just, I just wonder if you might have some idea about how I should find this baby griffin of yours. You mean of Lord Silverhands? Jelso rubs her chain. Well, if I wanted to meet the master of the Thieves' Guild, I might try to pretend I was someone he knew, or at least someone he might want to know. Mm, that's all well and good, you say. But do you have any idea who might fit that bill? I don't know, she also sighs in exasperation. You're supposed to be the one with underworld connections here. Aren't you aware of any other thieves who live in Waterdeep? You might recall that I'm not part of the Thieves' Guild, you tell her. We freelancers prefer to give the Gilded Thieves their own space. They have a tendency to want to cut us open otherwise. She also remains unimpressed. You've heard of Maroon the Masked, she eventually offers. You give her a cautious nod. He's supposedly the greatest thief in Waterdeep, correct? She continues, not waiting for your reply. We've been after him forever, but no one even seems to know what he looks like. You seeing where this is heading, you play dumb for the nice Sivilar, hoping that she might somehow take pity on you. So? He could even be a female, or a halfling to boot. So what's stopping you from presenting yourself to the Thieves' Guild as Maroon the Masked? You rattle off a list in your mind that includes the fact that just because you don't know what Maroon looks like doesn't mean that someone inside the Thieves' Guild isn't much wiser about the issue than you. Also, you don't especially relish the idea of the journey to the Thieves' Guild headquarters in Skullport. That would mean risking a journey through Undermountain, which you would rather avoid. But you keep your mouth shut and shrug at the Sivilar. Nothing? Turn to page 21. Then it's settled. 
She also says in the kind of final tone that you usually only hear when someone in her position tells you you're under arrest. I suppose it is, you say, unless I can come up with a better idea. The Sibilar glares down at you, sure that you're just trying to waste your time. To be fair, you are hoping that a bit of delaying might work in your favor, but perhaps it's not such a wise idea to be so obvious about that in front of her. I guess not, you say with a shrug. If only Maroon the Masked can get the job done, then Maroon the Masked I shall be! She also favors you with the kind of smile your parents would give you when you proved you weren't as stupid as they feared. You rub your chin. The only question is exactly how I should go about it. You can either wear a disguise, turn to page 31, be yourself, turn to page 33, or find a wizard to disguise you, turn to page 36. Well, everybody tells me that I should just be myself, so that's what I'm going to do. Well, since no one knows what Maroon the Mask looks like, there's no reason for anyone to believe Maroon doesn't look like you, right? You decide to walk into the king to, uh, you decide to walk into the king to swoon for, a tavern with an entrance to Undermountain, and give it a shot. Hey there, whispered to the bartender. I'm looking for a way to get to the Xanathar. The bartender chuckles. Oh's asking, he says. Maroon the Masked, you say as confidently as you can manage. Perhaps you've heard of me? The bartender gives you a sidelong look, and for a moment, you think this might all work out. Then she bursts out laughing. <laughs> is, is, it, is that so funny? You ask. She shakes her head at you and then calls out to the rest of the patrons in the room. Hey, folks! We got another one! Says they're Maroon the Masked! What's that? The third one this week? Ha! <laughs> you blush bright red and show yourself out. Soon afterward, you realize you're going to need to leave town to get away from the laughter that follows you. The end. Okay, so that was embarrassing. I guess they know that I'm not Maroon the Master. Let's try wearing a disguise. No need to complicate things. You make yourself a cheap mask out of a black bandana with eye holes cut into it, and you darken your hair with handfuls of soot. Even your mother wouldn't recognize you, and if she did, she'd start in right away about how you should have been a doctor like your father and your sister. You look like a villain from a bard's tale, she also says. With a name like Maroon the Masked, what would you expect? She shrugs her shoulders. Fair point. Just try not to get yourself killed in there. Aw, Sibilar, I didn't know you cared. Before you recover the baby Griffin. After that, you're on your own. Chase it, you give her a firm nod. Wish me luck. If you don't manage to bring that Griffin back for me, you're going to need a lot more than luck. Turn to page 34. Now get moving, the Sibilar says. Time's wasting. Admittedly, you were trying to waste time, hoping that the problem would somehow solve itself. I'm on the case, you tell Jalso. Perhaps I should just throw you straight in jail and save us both the embarrassment of your inevitable failure. And waste an excellent costume? I spent a whole minute setting this up, you say, gesturing towards your face. She takes a swing at you with her fist, but you scamper out of the way and keep moving. Uh, don't get your scabbard in a twist, you shout over your shoulder as you charge into the night. I'll have your griffin back in good hands in no time at all. You have my word on it. What good is the word of a thief? asks the Sibilar. You wonder the same thing as you decide where to start your hunt. Off to Down Shadow to recruit some help? Turn to page 38. Down to Skullport? Turn to page 45. Um, let's go to Skullport. You need to thank Jalso for coming up with this crazy plan to impersonate Maroon the Masked. You didn't think it was going to work. Although your intentions are good and you're feeling positive about the power of your disguise, you find yourself heading to the Underdark. Uh, not the subterranean realm known for its strange creatures, but a tavern of the same name over in the Trade Ward. Rather than change course and head straight to Skullport, you convince yourself that if or when Jalso catches up with you, you can tell her you were trying to find a member of Thieves Guild topside who you could follow to their secret headquarters in Skullport. 
When you get there, the half-elf bartender spots your mask and beckons you over. She seems unsure as to who you might be, but she's willing to hazard a guess. Maroon? Never one to pass up a golden opportunity to impersonate someone else, you nod in agreement. Who else would so brazenly wear a mask in public like this? But why would you come here now? she asks, confused that someone of your stature would darken her door. I have business in Skullport, and I am looking for a way to reach it quickly. I heard that you might be able to help me out in that regard. The bartender's face cracks with a wide smile. We happen to have a secret passageway in our basement, she whispers to you. You cannot believe your luck. When you'd realized your altered destination, you had been hoping to rest your feet for a bit while you got up the courage for what you had agreed to do. To remain here now would look suspicious. You stifle the urge to cringe at your fortune. You don't say, could you be so kind as to permit me to use this route? For the great and famous Maroon the Mask? Of course! The bartender takes you by the hand and leads you into the tavern's back room. In the far corner, she pushes aside a rack of shelves stocked with supplies, exposing a wooden door. She removes a bar on this side of the door and hands you a lit torch from a sconce on the wall, watching you expectantly as you take it. Beyond the open door, you see a set of stairs leading down into, into the darkness. I'm so excited, the bartender says. You'll have to tell me all about your adventures when you get back. I certainly will, you say, as you venture down the stairs. The bartender closes the door behind you, and you hear the solid thunk of the door's bar falling into place. Rather than waiting to starve to death in the stairwell, you continue down. After a long hike that meanders deeper and deeper underground, you emerge in the high part of Skullport, away from the wide river that runs through the cavern that encapsulates it. While you're glad to no longer be in the stairwell, you're not sure where you should go next. You cast about for clues as to where the Xanathar might be. There are a few suspicious characters in suspicious situations around you, as there always are in Skullport. But which is worth investigating? Follow a floating skull? Turn to page 57. Follow the sound of a crying child? Turn to page 62. Follow a thief? Turn to page 64. Hmm. Let's follow the floating skull. Yeah. A skull floats overhead, unattached to anything at all. Most particularly, not a body or a neck. Fortunately, it doesn't seem interested in you. Instead, it's wandering about over the house of Skullport like it's a mystic, haunting guard on some kind of unfathomable patrol. You chase after it, thinking that since you're looking for a floating head thing, a beholder, a floating skull might somehow lead you to it. It zips about the sky over Skullport, such as it is, moving rapidly from the low rooftops all the way up to the ceiling's apex. You climb on top of a ramshackle building so you can keep an eye on it, trying to remain in the shadows as you do. The skull keeps moving, getting farther away. You chase it, leaping from roof to roof and keeping it within sight. When you jump onto one roof, in particularly awful repair though, your right foot goes straight through the roof and you yelp out loud in surprise and pain. That's when the skull turns towards you. While you were following it, the floating skull seemed like more of a curiosity than anything else. But now that it's coming straight at you, it's terrifying. You yank your foot out of the rotting roof, turn and run. You dash across the rooftops, doing your best to avoid stabbing your foot through another one, until you realize that as long as you're atop the houses, the skull can see you for sure. Well, uh, that's assuming it can see you at all, it doesn't have eyeballs, but despite its lack of eyes, it's doing a fine job of tracking you so far. You need to get out of sight, quick. You leap down into an alley and sprint off in a random direction. You take several turns through a maze of streets and byways. Huffing and puffing from your race through town, you find a dark corner, well out of the way and plenty distant from where you started out, to sit down and rest. The skull lowers itself right in front of you, facing you with its empty eyes, and hovers just out of reach. You are new, the skull says with a voice that doesn't come from its non-existent lips, but somehow still rings in your ears. Are you a wizard? Experience has taught you that when someone asks you if you are something, they either need that sort of person or want to kill that sort of person. Either way, you're in trouble. You try to read the skull's expression, but there's nothing there to see. 
I am one of the skulls of Skullport. Skull says, are you a wizard? Hesitant and uncertain, you give your best guess as to what the right answer might be. Yes? Excellent, Skull says, floating closer. It emits a green glow from around its edges. Prepare to be absorbed. Wait, you shout as you throw up your hands. That sounds fatal and painful. The skulls are beyond pain. I'm not a wizard, cry. I lied. The skull stops moving toward you and the green glow around it fades. You are not a wizard. You shake your head emphatically. I can't even do card tricks. The skull gazes at you for a long moment before it speaks again. You're too afraid to move, thinking that it might be about to leave you alone if you don't run. You shall not be absorbed, it says. You let out a huge breath you didn't realize you'd even been holding. <sighs> the penalty for lying to a skull is death. You shove past the skull and sprint away at top speed, screaming the entire way. The skull isn't quite as tenacious about your punishment as you are about escaping it. Eventually, you find a passage to the surface, and the skull fails to follow you. Once you make it to Waterdeep, you realize that while you've escaped the skull, you've failed in your mission entirely. However, you decide that you can keep using your disguise as Maroon the Masked in another city. Baldur's Gate, here you come. The end. Well, that didn't go very well, so let's go back. Instead of following the skull, why don't we try following a thief? That makes sense. This is to catch a thief, after all. Out of the corner of your eye, you've been watching a thief you know from Waterdeep. She's called Peggy, on account of the fact that she has a peg where her left leg used to be. She likes to think she's as quiet and stealthy as the sleekest burglar in the city, even Maroon the Mask. But in fact, she staggers around, making so much noise you can hear her coming from streets away. Another thing you know about Peggy is that while she often tries to play herself off like some kind of pirate, she's actually a landlubber and a known member of the Thieves' Guild to boot. If anyone knows where the Xanathar lives, or the location of the Thieves' Guild headquarters in Skullport, it would be Be uh, Peggy. Unfortunately, you can't just go up and ask Peggy for help. After all, she still blames you for the loss of her leg. It wasn't your fault that you managed to outrun her when an owlbear stormed after you both for stealing its eggs. Well, not entirely your fault. You decide to follow Peggy to see if she'll lead you anywhere interesting. As long as she doesn't see you, you shouldn't have to worry about her trying to exact her revenge. You stick to the shadows and watch her roam. She wanders around the city for a bit, stopping in a tavern or three along the way, and eventually she leads you to a posh mansion in the best part of Skullport. As she enters the place, you realize that it's way too nice for a thief as rotten as Peggy to ever be able to afford. It must be the Xanathar's home. You can't exactly barge in and ask to see the owner, though. In fact, it would be best if you never crossed paths with him at all. You stake the place out for a while, hoping to see the Beholder himself come floating out so you can sneak in during his absence. Eventually, though, you get bored with sitting and watching, and you decide to start poking around. That sort of impulse has gotten you into plenty of trouble over the years, but it hasn't gotten you killed. Yet. As you circle the building, you spy a light on in a large room with a wide balcony that looks out over the rest of the city. You decide that this is as good a place as any to start. You climb up the wall beneath the balcony and slip onto it as silently as you can manage. You hear voices coming from inside, so you sidle up to the doorway that leads out onto the balcony from the house proper and you listen. You hear Peggy talking first. You lined up a trainer for the Griffin. That's great, boss. I never figured you'd manage it that fast. You underestimate the kind of pull I have in this city, another voice says, deep and inhumanly hollow at the same time. It could only be the Xanathars. You stifle a shiver and continue to listen. Is that what you want me to bring the trainer down here tonight? Peggy stifles a yawn. This griffin's not getting any younger. Is the trainer going to be ready? With the money I'm paying, he'd better be. You peer through the doorway from the balcony to see a gigantic floating eye petting a little griffin with one of its ten prehensile eye stalks. On a desk beside the Xanathar, there's a huge sack filled with gold coins spilling out of it. 
The Xanathar has his back to you, but unfortunately, Peggy does not. Her eyes go wide in surprise as she sees you. We can either snatch the money, turn to page 75, or snatch the griffin, turn to page 77. Well, we did come here to get the griffin, after all. So let's get the money. You point toward the large stack of gold sitting on the Xanathar's desk, which sits behind the beholder out of his line of vision. Peggy goggles at you as you sneak your way toward it, but the Xanathar doesn't seem to notice. Maybe beholders can't read humanoid faces all that well, or maybe he's too preoccupied with the griffin. You signal to Peggy that you'll split the money with her if she keeps the Xanathar distracted, or at least doesn't point out to the beholder that you're robbing him. The thief gives you a discreet nod as you creep farther into the room. You don't trust her for an instant, but wow, that's a lot of gold sitting there. Too big a score to just walk away from. You quietly scoop up the bag, taking care not to jingle any of the coins together. You smile at Peggy, who seems impressed by your skill. Few thieves would even attempt such a thing, and here you are pulling it off underneath the floating bulk of the Xanathar himself. Just as you turn to slip out of the building without a trace, Peggy stabs a finger at you and shouts, Boss! It's a thief! And not one of ours! The beholder spins around to see what Peggy's talking about, but you're already on your way out by the time that happens. You knew you couldn't rely on Peggy, just like she probably knew she couldn't believe you, and you were ready to bolt at the first sign of treachery. She's timed it just right to make it hard on you, though. If she'd said something right away, you'd have just fled. Now, though, you're carrying a heavy sack of coins and have to make it back to the balcony to have your shot at getting away. As you dash for the balcony, a ray stabs out from one of the beholder's eyes, and the floor of the balcony disappears, saving you the trouble of leaping over the railing. You would have liked to save the little griffin, but that's clearly impossible now. For someone who doesn't want to die, anyway. At least the sack of gold you stole should be enough for you to leave Waterdeep behind and set yourself up in a new life far, far away, you hope. The end. Well, we didn't get the griffin, but we got the gold. Okay, so let's see what would have happened if we tried to get the griffin. First, you need to cause a distraction from your real plan to buy you time to get the baby griffin. You slip over toward the desk, signaling to Peggy that you'll split the gold with her if she lets you steal it. The moment you pick it up, though, you know she's going to betray you. Before she has a chance to react, you hurl the open sack straight at her. She tries to catch it, but it splashes against her chest instead, sending gold coins scattering everywhere. The Xanathar screeches in surprise at Peggy for a moment. Well, he does, you leap over and snatch up the baby griffin. Look at it this way, you say to the beholder. You're going to save so much money by not having to hire a trainer. Give me back that griffin, the beholder says. As you race toward the balcony with the griffin in your arms, the Xanathar fires a ray at you from one of his eyes. Turn to page 35. The ray catches you square, and you expect to fall over dead. Instead, you feel a rush of goodwill toward the Xanathar. It must have been a charm spell. You wonder if the two of you might become best friends, but your abject terror of being disintegrated drives you to throw off whatever mind-altering magic he's using. It does cause you to stagger a bit, though, and you inadvertently step on the little griffin's tail. It screeches and springs into the air with you, clutching its back legs. The two of you glide past the Xanathar's balcony to a safe landing, well out of the reach of the Beholder's eye stalks. From there, you race through town and the dungeons above it until you are safe in Waterdeep. You find Jalso and her watchers waiting for you when you emerge into the daytime sun. I'll take that, she says, as she snatches the griffin from your arms. Plus the credit for its rescue, I'm sure, you say. And you get to go home rather than to jail, she says, as she stalks off towards the home of the lord who lost the little griffin. Everyone's happy, right? You have to admit, she has a point. The end. Well, we got the griffin, but it's not exactly the most satisfying ending. Unfortunately, that's how it goes sometimes. So, this is a fun story. Uh, none of the endings are 100% satisfying, so part of the challenge is deciding which one you like best. But I think that's enough for now. So for now, it's the end.